Now we do have one of those blue zones that was mentioned last night in the, uh, in the uh, United States. It's actually Loma Linda. Yeah, that's where Loma Linda University is and it's an Adventist school. And the Adventists have for a long time focused on health and lifestyle and they tell their congregation that they should be lacto-ovo vegetarians. They actually may be changing that based on their own research. Um, showing this, that if you divide the congregation and the people that they're following up into five categories, the people who eat no animals whatsoever, um, the lacto-ovo vegetarian, the people who eat fish and dairy, those who eat the regular American diet at the bottom, and then uh, the semi-vegetarian where they just purposely cut the you know, meatless Mondays a few times a week, they reduce the number of animal products but they do eat everything. <clears throat> if you do divide them into those five categories, you see a nice uh, degradation of the amount of um, obesity indicated by the body mass in the index it gets smaller and smaller as you be restrict the animals, the amount of diabetes, and particularly the hypertension. And so that bottom line of completely plant-based nutrition resulting in less obesity, diabetes, and hypertension really is a lesson, again, for us all because uh, we could all do better. Now, um, the next paper that I'd like to uh, outline from them is for all the skeptics like myself in the audience who say, you know, what difference does it make about risk factors? Uh, are we going to have people dying at the same rate with better numbers? And the answer is no, you really do decrease mortality um, significantly, particularly in men. And as the study gets longer and longer and they have more deaths, they'll be able to see uh, undoubtedly um, that this is a true principle. The more plant-based nutrition you do, the less heart disease, less uh, all-cause mortality as well. But going back to that blood pressure thing, I, I like to focus on it whenever I'm lecturing in the United States because it is a big burden for us all. Um, if we look at the vegetarian diets, you can't see any of the names I know, but I just want you to see the little graph on the, the uh, little Fisher plot on the right um, that if you have that vertical line that says, um, yeah, you're, there's no difference between the two or if you're to the right, then vegetarian diets are actually riskier uh, because they increase your blood pressure. But decreasing the blood pressure is what the vast majority of the literature has found. And so it's worth seeing that graphic just because you, you know that people have been looking at this for a while. Uh, this should not be lost on in any clinicians that diet makes a difference. And particularly vegetarian diets have a tendency to decrease blood pressure a little, a, a bit, or a lot. And so um, the conclusion is very clear uh, that everyone with hypertension ought to be treated with diet first. Uh, that's in our new uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines. And hopefully everyone will focus on uh, lifestyle, uh, exercise, diet to try to reduce blood pressure. If we were, uh, how does it work by the way? Uh, and so I had to throw this one in, this is the Intermap study. Uh, centered out of Northwestern in Chicago, or uh, Jeremiah Stamler, I think he's probably 98 years old now, but he's been at this for many decades, and they actually came, uh, came to the conclusion by doing micronutrient analysis that the best correlate with uh, the blood pressure reduction, the blood pressure pill, if you will, uh, in vegetables is uh, the vegetable protein amino acid, glutamic acid. and so. Uh, we stick with the beans, we stick with the grains, and the blood pressure will fall. So I'm focusing on it because this is what we're facing, folks. This is uh, ex healthcare expenditures, and in red, it's so-called so ex excess healthcare expenditures. Well, um, stuff that we could really do something about. As the population ages, we're going to get more joint replacements and more valve replacements and all that sort of thing. And if people aren't dead, it's going to cost more. No question about that. But what, what part can we easily, relatively easily avoid? Uh, that is we would call excess. Well, at the top of the curve, uh, for those of you in the front, you can see that the biggest graph for what our Medicare uh, folks are paying for is hypertension. 58% of all Medicare beneficiaries actually have systemic hypertension. And so um, if you try to look at the expenditures for medication uh, uh, and hospitalization and um, you know, heart failure and stroke and all the things that happen, uh, you know, the renal failure, the kidney failure, um, most folks don't understand that 
Once you're on dialysis, you automatically qualify for Medicare, and it's about $86,537 per Medicare beneficiary on dialysis per year, every year. And so uh, anything that we could do to lower that or eliminate that would be tremendous. Okay, so uh, the last year that I could actually get the cost for uh, analysis for hypertension was 2007, and it was about 30% of Medicare costs. And if you fast forward to 2020, just a couple of years ago, when we we're going to hit that trillion dollar mark for Medicare expenditures, 30% um, of that, that would go a long way to, for schools, roads, buses, you know, all kinds of infrastructure that we're spending on an unnecessary disease. So help us with this. Uh, let's get everybody on, onto um, a healthier diet so we can eliminate that blight on our society. Thank you. <laughs>